Welcome back to VFX and Chill. Hashi, we didn't actually specify who was talking first this week. I talked first. What's up, everybody? Uh, this week, look, I am just going to get right to it. Is that okay, Hash? Do we have any big updates to talk about? Yes, let's jump okay. right into it. I mean, there are a few updates to a few pieces of software that might be worth mentioning. Michael, at some you were a today. disembodied voice. I did not introduce you. So you will sit quietly in the corner until we're ready to talk about those things. Uh, I had to put my AirPod in. Can I, I hope everyone can still hear me. Um, so here's the deal. Let me make sure everyone can. Hashi, can you still hear me? Um, I can hear you and the broadcast. So I'm trying to figure oh. that out. <laughs> okay. I am displaced from time. Okay, well, uh, while you figure out how to get out of the void, uh, let me just tell you, I want to tell you, the viewer, something. I want you to imagine a person in your head. I want you to... I can hear you. can hear me? All right. I want you to think of a person. Think of a person who is a director, a photographer, a writer, a visual effects artist, and a software designer. Uh, Imagine this person has a blog called ProLost which is beloved by all of us. Imagine he's the chief creative officer at Maxon. Before that, he designed the Magic Bullet color grading system, co-created the Fountain screenplay format and the screenwriting app Slugline. And before that, he wrote a book called The DV Rebels uh, Guide and uh, The DV Rebels Guide, excuse me, an all mm. digital approach to making killer action movies on the cheap. Before that, he co-founded the legendary effects firm, The Orphanage. Before that, he spent four years at Industrial Light and Magic, where he worked on some of the most important movies of my lifetime, like Mission Impossible, Men in Black, Star Trek First Contact, and a little movie called Twister. And before that, folks... What? The, the Twister? The Twister. And bef- the epic adaptation of the classic epi- board game. Incredible. They went a very different creative direction. And before all of that, folks... He was human, just like us, but not anymore. Today, welcome to the show, Mr. Stu Mashowitz. Thank you for being here, sir. Hey, guys. Stu. Hey. Hey, wow. it's so good to see you, man. It's fun to be here. <laughs> I'm on the you're show. You're on the show. Usually you're out there having hey. a comment, like some kind of chump. <laughs> I love it. I know. It's, I've, I've really enjoyed, you know being on the sidelines this can't possibly be nearly as fun as making fun of you guys from a safe no, distance can't. you can't <laughs> nope you're in it now <laughs> I'm in it. oh man uh so oh. look uh, i something that is no secret to anyone uh well first off before i get to any of that you know what <laughs> We made a list of the things we're going to talk about today. We didn't talk about in what order we were going to talk about them. <laughs> uh, no. We're sitting with with Stu. You get you. He's he's worked on so, the entire list that Seth just mentioned, which is ridiculous because it it yeah it immediately summons a billion questions from your entire VFX childhood. Like how could you possibly today? be this old? I think <laughs> is the main is the main question, and still look so great. Oh, so great. <laughs> and and uh, he keys so well too. That doesn't really transfer with age very well. Um, <laughs> no, that's Stu, a skill. Uh, his the thing that Stu has blessed me with throughout our friendship is uh, up until we were in, in the middle of a pandemic, we I, we would regularly see each other in Portland once a year at the Red Giant All Company meeting. And it was very early on once I had started at the company where Stu st- I don't remember what story it was, but you started to tell a story like from ILM and then you paused in this way of like, Oh, no one cares about this. And then you looked at me, (laughs) we made eye contact and you said, Oh wait, you you either said, Oh wait, you're here. Or you went, Oh wait, you love this inside baseball stuff. And like rolled up your sleeves (laughs) and just got to work telling me about helicopters in John Knoll's office. And it was the greatest. (laughs) Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I do have that thing where it, it, no one would know it from my online presence, but I actually do always worry that people are super bored with what I'm talking about, but I'm never worried about that when I'm with you, <laughs> Seth. 
Yeah, boredom by proximity. Nice it is. It is. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I'm here to. Pro- I'm here to provide people the feeling of being interesting by proximity and by comparison. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, I have the clip. Just because I have the clip, let's just show it. This is this is one of like this is the scene that you actually did a really great Twitter uh, uh, thread about a couple years back when it was like the however many year anniversary of Twister. But this shot was like one of your first big shots, wasn't it? it was the house shot? Yeah, it was a. It was a. So it was right after Mission Impossible, and I had, I had kind of secured myself a reputation of being good at what at the time at ILM was referred to as hard surface, you know, animation or whatever to, to distinguish it from the the creature visual effects that had that the that the pipeline there was really built around um it's one of the things that I think is kind of interesting about the history of Mission Impossible and the work we did with the helicopter and the channel and all that is that it was a it was kind of a, a pipeline buster for ILM because it wasn't a dinosaur um, or or a job of the hut or whatever. Um, so then, you know, uh, Twister was really kind of the domain of the super nerds at ILM who were doing the particle simulations and stuff. And they had set these shots aside as these kind of special cases that required more of a hand animated approach, I guess. And um and so I, I, my schedule freed up just in time to be, to be put on this what this little group of four shots here. The, this one in particular, I, I love having it on a loop because the specific little details. Which, if in any one of these are not, I, from my understanding, everything here is you, right? Everything that's attached to the house or related to the house or coming off the house, that's you, right? Yeah. So the. Yes. Um, so uh, Pat Neary uh, helped me with the particle stuff of the flying debris that goes by in the in the foreground, and I can't remember what did I I think I think and I think he composited the shot as well because it, there was it, there was so much animation and lighting to mm-hmm. do um, that that I, I was I was busy for I think I think I got four months to do <sighs> this shot. And which is just un unheard of. Today, yeah, but it's also you know? why this looks um, so damn good. Like, well, and it was just, it was still, you know, I, I, this is like my thing about kind of this era of ILM that I know you love, Seth, is that <laughs> this was still in this kind of transitional time between what you know I consider to be the golden age of visual effects, where they were. Um, integrated into production in a in a way that had like a little bit of pomp and ceremony to it. Where, okay, it is now time for an optical shot. You know, yeah. bring out Dennis Murin, bring out the VistaVision camera. You know, like there was a ceremonial like everything is different when we're doing visual effects kind of yeah. thing. You know, and um, so this shot, so so Twister is among the last movies to be shot with that kind of classic ILM mentality. And in a way, it's almost like a weird kind of preemptive version of like what you see now where a Mission Impossible movie will be shot with one kind of camera for most of it, but then we'll have like an IMAX style camera for the action scenes or whatever. So the, the visual effect shots in Twister feel different because they're shot with different cameras, different lenses. And, and yet, you know, the, the, the conscious effort is to integrate them into the photography of the rest of the movie. But the like weird kind of subcurrent of it is the visual effect shots have a little bit of extra zhuzh to them for like all that je ne sais quoi of like, you know, fancy cameras and whatever. They do. I was watching, Um, uh, what lies beneath? I think. Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. It was the other Zemeckis weird one. It was the. Uh, uh, oh God, death becomes her. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Which yeah. is one of my, which is a favorite of my wife's, and we, that that the first mirror transfer where like you know we move in to the mirror and we like mirror we see that age transformation happen. The it shot opens up and it's like, you feel that extra bit of grain like it's that extra little bit of like vista vision grain and it's moving in a way to where you're like we're about to watch a visual effect now that is this wonderful feeling that like i i loved like yeah yeah it's so wild to to, that that yeah we were so geeked on it that we kind of picked up on that um 
Yeah, so it's, it's fun to be a part of that tradition, even as it was kind of on its way out. Um, I, but uh, I won't... but yeah, this shot was was known to you know early on that it was going to just be kind of a a case of just needing to chisel away at the problem in a in a kind of highly manual fashion. <laughs> I, I promise not to make you talk about Twister uh, beyond this shot. And I, I do want to talk about it for two hours, <laughs> but the, it, just a couple details that I, I love every time is the, the, the for sale sign floating almost Thank like you. just <laughs> in the border of cartoonish in the way that it's like right before right. you see the house. And then the way it just, yeah, yep. and the way it spits out the tub, uh, <laughs> so good thank you i don't know if i can claim credit for the idea of the for sale sign that probably came from mr debont but um but the tub was my idea and i went to the modeling department and i asked them to make me a clawfoot tub and it's just that, uh, that tub the, is the casualty of this car wreck it just fly it's like flying out the <laughs> windshield yeah it was uh that was that was uh a real treat the day that that model came in. Um, you know, the house was built, um, you know, not by me, but it was built to be taken apart. Um, but it wasn't rigged in any way. So I um, animated it in soft image and each board by board. each board and whatever is, you know, its own individual object that is kind of separated in the hierarchy. But I didn't have any chops in terms of like my technical ability to do something like remove a board from the hierarchy of the house's animation and at like you know transition it to yeah uh, a different one so i would just literally have two copies of the geometry in there and then i would have to go in into the render scripts and say on this frame stop rendering this board as part of the house and start rendering its twin that i've then animated to fly through the air so there was a lot of typing involved in this shot Oh, wow. Um, that's that's yeah, now like the Seth Worley way of do, <laughs> doing It's the most, <laughs> it's just like this inefficient, but uh, quick and dirty. Oh my God, not quick and dirty. The, thank God you had four months or however many you said for. Every single one of four billion steps is quick and dirty. <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> And, and then and the other the other thing that that I think is fun to note about this shot is that um, is that it was it's a broad daylight you know kind oh, yeah. of sun and shadow shot that again today with you know modern rendering engines would be nothing right you'd throw a sky dome at it and it, it'd be done but back then that was not possible and I and I had done enough lighting to be kind of frustrated with the limitations of just using, you know, of, of, of not having any kind of indirect bounce or anything like that. We didn't even really have the terms like global illumination back then or anything, but I knew what I was missing. And so I created this sky dome by just manually placing lights around a, a hemisphere a, around the, uh, the house and each one is casting soft shadows. Oh, and wow. as a result, uh, every frame of this took probably between eight to 12 hours to render. Um, so, <laughs> so it was kind of a, when it was, so I wouldn't run the shot very often, a, a full render because it was, it was expensive and it took up a lot of resources. So it was kind of a thing where when SH one was going to get rendered, like the, the nighttime crew would be kind of alerted, like, okay, Stu's shot is coming through <laughs> and I'd get like, this allocation of processors and we'd hope it was, it was done by the morning. Well, that's incredible. Um, now Stu, the, the chat is uh, having an argument. Well, not an argument, I should say a slight <laughs> disagreement about whether or not the trees are CG. Is that, a, is that a 2d? Uh, is that just a flat bed of trees there? No. So that it's, it's in the plate okay. and it wasn't augmented in any way. So it was carefully rotoscoped I thought uh, it'd by be hand a card. By, by someone. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's really there. It was, um, you know, that they shot it, they found this location specifically for this reveal. So it was scouted specifically to allow for this, but yeah, no, it's, uh, 
it, it's, I mean, it's such it's such a great shot because you just see the wind wind then you see something it's and then the little bam, hint of it right yeah there. it's the little shark fin that kind of comes up over it the is. corner that it's so such well, a great reveal thanks yeah i mean that was yeah it, that that's that's Jan. i mean that's why i was so incredibly stoked to work with him i mean i'll just like be brutally honest like so again to kind of characterize the difference between maybe how visual effects are done today and back then um Jan de Bont came to ILM a lot, you know, um, there, we didn't have, you know, frame IO and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. We could do INET transmissions where he could see a standard deaf version of a thing, but if you wanted to see a shot on film, he had to come see it at sea theater. Otherwise it would, we'd be shipping him reels of film that was not commonly done. So he was up there probably every two weeks and I, and I had a copy of the script at my desk <laughs> because back then you could ha- you could people read wanted those. to know things about the movie they worked yeah. on. <laughs> so I so somewhere I have the a signed copy of of the script of Twister. Well, that's something you've just, never told just... me before. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, and it was you know Seth. It's like all I could do not to just go full Chris Farley on him and just be like. So remember, remember speed? <laughs> remember everything about speed? Remember, remember when you shot, shot die, die hard? hard? <laughs> yes. I was working my way back. <laughs> it's like, you know, I tried to keep it cool, but like, you know, I was like 22 years old or something. Like, I'm sure I was not cool. <laughs> no, I've uh, seen pictures. Uh, you were cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no, no question that I was not cool. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, oh gosh, you said something a second ago that made me. Oh, no, it was the the tree question. I, when yeah. I, so we made a promo for this episode and <laughs> didn't show it to you before we started <laughs> playing it. <laughs> no, you did not. But I, I sat there like, uh, you know, uh, trying to match the animation of your house ma- and apply it to your face. And <laughs> thanks. And I was like, you know, I'm sitting here breaking apart this shot that Stu spent four months on. Uh, I'm like, I'm like re rotoing these trees and like, like doing all this stuff. And my son comes in. I go, hey, check this out. And he goes, did you did you have to cut those trees out? He's first immediately looks at it like, did you have to mask those trees? And I was like, and we ended up breaking uh, the shot apart together. Right. Yeah, he knew the right words. But we were like breaking the shot apart together. And I was like, well, look at the original. This is so cool. Look, Stu had to do each of these boards one by one, etc. And so. Uh, if you ever meet my son, you're just gonna have to retell him everything that <laughs> you told us and told me. Um, I love my my son said something that was a great uh, VFX thing, which was like he squinted at something. and He said, "I think this show is mocap. I don't think they're animating yeah. that." And I was like, "Whoa!" And this is referring to I can't remember what it's called. Sid the Science it's, Kid. It's, it's uh, no, it's a Henson one. They're uh, that's Sid, but maybe they're, something else. They're like. They're like dancing and, and talking about math and they've got big feet and they have like a puppeted face and a mocapped body that they capture mm-hmm. live. Yeah. Uh, so I'm what it's called. Sid the Science Kid does that. I, it may not be what you're talking about, but that uh, Elliot and I had a, the same interaction on Sid the Science Kid. He was like, there's something weird about the way they move. They move like they're bigger than they actually are. And then that led us down the rabbit hole of Henson's whole motion capture thing that they do. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone has not seen um, Stu's amazing digital short Tank. Tank or the equally compelling making of, um, I always highly recommend those two as as a small way to like crawl into Stu's yes. brain. <laughs> the uh, ba- making of Tank which, especially uh, is the one how to crawl into Stu's brain. Yes. Yeah. And I, I yeah, work. knowing that someone would would be willing to make things that hard on themselves to make them that good, uh, made me feel not alone. In uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thanks, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've very kind people have asked about a sequel to Tank, and it sort of feels like after giving birth to triplets, people asking <laughs> you if you're going to have any more kids. <laughs> I love my kids, but but that was a lot of work. I think I'm good. Excellent. Um, you know, uh, we can always come back to all the things we were just talking about, but there is it's no secret to anyone. We all work in the same place, uh, and that place is what? yeah, that place. Well, just like we're physically in the same place right now. 
Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. A little <laughs> cramped here, but oh, nice. And, uh, <laughs> hanging out with you guys. That place is Maxon, a company that just this week released a ton of new things, as Michael tried to spoil for all of us, even though it was on spoiler. It's a real known thing. And the stewiest of these new things, I would say, is this new addition to VFX Suite called Bang. Stu, are you cool if we talk about Bang for a little bit? Absolutely. I'm super excited about Bang. Can you give us some backstory? I know this this existed prior, but then we then we took it. And yeah. it's ours now. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's not ours. It no, I'm super happy to, to, to give the backstory because it's, fu- it's a funny one to me. So I... You know, I wrote this book, The DB Rebels Guide, like you mentioned, and there's a whole chapter in there about digital gunfire. So I, you know, grew up loving the action movies of the 80s and, uh, and you know, was lucky enough to be a kid at a time where the presence of a gun on screen meant that you were watching something that was fantasy. Yeah. Um, so I had this really kind of love of like the way that that guns were a part of the drama and and kineticness of the movies that I loved and like any dorky kid with a camera wanted to find a way to replicate that and wanted to do it safely so had this kind of whole pipeline around um shooting with airsoft guns or whatever kind of like toy gun I could paint black or whatever and adding muzzle flashes, among other things like flying shells and stuff, in in post, and I kind of codified all that in the book, you know. And there's a bunch of stuff in there about, you know, the specifics of like why to use this flash with this type of gun or whatever. And um, and then uh, y- you know, little by little, there started to become. You know, I would I would like hand paint these muzzle flashes basically for for the, as in in an After Effects and line them up, and and then people started to want to sort of help help out dorks like us by shooting elements so they'd actually like fire a gun in a dark stage and get a nice uh, image of it, and and that felt like a godsend to me. But of course, it always had the limitation of like you could only get it from one angle. Um, Usually there'd be some kind of overexposure in the middle of the of the flash, which would mean that it'd be hard to uh, adjust it to to fit into your shot that maybe isn't shot in the dark, etc. So I started to formulate an idea for a plugin to create 3D muzzle flashes and After Effects, and I actually built a prototype of it and brought it to the founders of Red Giant and said, "I want to make this plugin," and they said, "Absolutely not! No way! No one will ever use it. It's a dumb idea." <laughs> and and they were probably right, <laughs> <In the hospital. laughs> um, but I was like sad and I kind of slunk away and thought, okay, I guess I'll just stay working on magic bullet. And like I'm told, and, uh, and then I don't know, it felt to me like it was a matter of like a few months went by, uh, before bang, uh, came out and I looked at bang and just thought, well, that is weird because obviously someone tunneled into my brain and saw all of my blueprints and like Ming that I wish that, that I would have been smart enough to make, uh, but way better, way more thought through and like with so much detailed control that I would have actually been embarrassed to put in because I would have thought no one will ever love muzzle flashes as much as I do. <laughs> um, so I reached out to the developer, Christian Lett, and I just said, Dude, you nailed it! Congratulations, this is amazing. Can I be a beta tester? Like, I, I can I buy it twelve times to thank you for how awesome this is, and have been a devout lover and user of it ever since, and have really it's it's really never been far from my mind that this was just a plugin that I felt needed more attention, more eyes on it, and maybe just a little bit more of the kind of glorious resources that we have to help uh, make these things more awesome. So. Uh, you know, as a part of trying to bring the, the VFX suite to life, you know, it's only a couple years old now and, and, and VFX suite is still finding its identity as a collection of effects. You know, we have stuff for cleanup and for tracking and we have super comp, which I'm always gratified to see you guys using on this show, but I want it to just continue to evolve as this incredible tool set of like 
necessary effects that maybe you don't use them every day, but the day you do use them, they save you tons and tons of time and effort. And so I'm super stoked to kind of have Bang be among the first of those kinds of tools that we're adding to VFX Suite. Uh, so we got to work directly with Christian and we uh, kind of cleaned it up and improved the experience and added some of the nice, you know, red giant goodies like our uh, optical glow and things like that. And and we've got Bang in VFX Suite 2.0. It's Couldn't be such happier, a freaking but... cool uh to like it, it's one of those things you open it up and it's immediately fun because you like apply it and yeah. then there's a gun wire frame and there's already a flash and there's a big button that says bang that you push and it creates <laughs> it's just like it, it's so cool and fun and of course the first things that hashi and i think of are like how what else can we use this for besides guns um yeah and so i think we might try to do a little bit of that today but i do want to I've sat in rooms, dude, where like you talked about, you've given us like given us like VFX history lessons. Um, sure. Uh, I want. Can we talk about RoboCop a little bit and some of this? Like, well, I tell you what, let's get into this. However, you want to get into this. I just know that I prepped a RoboCop clip, and that means you're going to be talking about <laughs> RoboCop, which means I want to get to that very quickly. Yes. Let's, yeah. let's switch over to the RoboCop uh, image on screen too. I think the the loop is. Oh, is, oh, uh, it's oh. Well, this one's going to end people. So hang on. Let me switch over to uh, Stu's. uh... (laughs) Here, let's look at Stu's After Effects. Why don't we? Yeah, let's let's get to RoboCop, but we can just kind of talk a little bit about like what you were saying about Bang here. So, um, yeah, the the big thing that that we added to this version is that we now kind of have these gun wireframes here. So, you know, it just makes it so super easy to just position the flash in the right place. You know, look at that. And yeah. what I love about having you involved with the plugin is that that object with nothing else looks better than when you composite stuff yeah. into a shot yeah. in general. <laughs> it, it already has the right bloom and op- it, it has so many things going for it just just as it comes in. And I love uh, that. So I'll, I'll, let's let's dive into exactly why that is. So, um, uh, you know, first of all, it's just really easy to get started with this, right? Like, so this was something that Christian had already done a beautiful job of, was creating all these presets, right? So right away, you you don't really even have to know what you're doing. You can just kind of, you know, I'm going to pick generic nine millimeter pistol here and it's, you know, awesome. But then, <laughs> then I, this is the part that when I saw this, you know, because this was in, this is a part of Bang 1.0 that you can just kind of sculpt the contour of this thing is like... <laughs> I mean, come on, like, no, nobody, (laughs) nobody, what did I do to deserve somebody just making this for (laughs) me? Like, it's just, it's it's so for me, right? Um, But yeah, so then you can see, okay, so we're we're out in the, the forest here in kind of broad daylight. And, you know, one of the things that we learned from the reference is that a flash will look bright in a dark environment, but typically in a daylight environment, you know, maybe not so much, maybe it's going to look a little, uh, uh, you know, the, the exposure comparatively will be darker compared to the rest of the shot. And so, um, that's really where using elements kind of falls apart, right? Because the elements tend to be shot on a dark stage and no matter how much dynamic range you try to capture, you're probably going to be blown out in the middle. And so my favorite thing to do with these, with these bang flashes is just take the after effects exposure and just drop it down. So this is just, uh, this is the view exposure and you can just see that there's HDR detail Look at that. in the flash and it's a true, you know, volumetric, uh, render. Those are so particles? It's actually, you know, yeah, it's, it's millions and millions of particles, <laughs> like wow. uh, so many that it's almost like one per pixel basically. Um, and it renders, you know, this fast, and uh, so so that alone is 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 kind of amazing. But of course, what what that allows, aside from like a full sort of, you know, log friendly HDR compositing pipeline, et cetera, is it allows you to just um, adjust the brightness down, and so you know you just have like an infinite supply of, you know, the right kind of flash. And then you can vary that brightness. There's a brightness random control, so each flash can have a different brightness. So if you're doing automatic fire, you get a bunch of randomization 
uh, for free. Stuff that we that we added that that I think is where where some of the Magic Bullet and VFX Suite stuff intersected really well with what was already awesome about Bang is, we, for instance, we added this highlight roll-off control here. So actually, if I take highlight roll-off to zero, you'll see even more of that HDR uh, effect. You know, So now it's like it's super blown out, but there's a ton of HDR detail in there. Like these pixel values are coming in at like two and three on a scale of zero to one. Um, or you can crank up highlight roll-off all the way and it's it's going to probably be subtle, but you can kind of see that like I'm I'm now kind of giving a soft like shoulder to the exposure of it, all without composited onto this video background. And then the other thing we have in VFX Suite is we have you know in SuperComp we have heat blur, which was one of my favorite ways to improve the realism of things like fire and flamey things that we're trying to composite over that typically that would just be sort of transparently added on. So we added heat blur um, to uh, to bang. So I think if I crank this up, yeah, so you can see now I'm like smudging out. That's too much, but it's just so you can kind of see the effect. I'm smudging out the background. And we even have a heat blur delay. So we can even get a little um, a little bit of residual heat. See it right what? there? <laughs> so, oh, that's ridiculous. So that's, that's the heat. And and so let me just show you like uh, where that inspiration came from. So one of my favorite things about what passes for my job is that I get to just sit and like geek out on the movies that I love uh, and uh, and call it work. So um, so this shot from Point Break, um, I always remember being able to visually see the heat ripples coming off of his gun in this shot. And it really helps that it's telephoto, right? But this is such great reference because you've got the great flash there and you can kind of see what I was showing where, um, where it's kind of fuzzing out the background. But then on the next shot, you oh, see, yeah. see, the, see the distortion of the car behind him there, right? So that, that gaseous explosion is continuing to expand after it's given up all of its like visible heat energy and and what what our, what friend of the show Todd Vaziri likes to point out is that the truly gutsy move when you're adding muzzle flashes to uh, to a shot is to not necessarily add them for every for every yeah. frame so in the days of film when you're when you're shooting an action scene one of the jobs of the camera operator would be to report back to the rest of the crew um, whether or not they saw muzzle flashes through the viewfinder. And uh, perhaps counterintuitively, if they did not see muzzle flashes through the viewfinder during the take, that was good news. Because the camera operator on a 35 millimeter motion picture camera doesn't see what gets recorded to film. They see the exact opposite. So you're shooting 24 frames per second and there's a rotating shutter that's opening up 1 48th of a second. So half the time of the frame's duration is devoted to, you know, the capture of the frame. The other half, a mirror rolls through and blocks the light from hitting the film so the film can be advanced to the next frame. You just answered a question I've all, you just answered a question I've never gotten a chance to ask because we don't do this stuff anymore. I had no idea that's yeah. how it worked. Yeah. So that's that's what a reflex camera is. So like the the mirror on the spinning shutter bounces the light through the uh, prism to to go through the um, the viewfinder. So so a camera operator might turn to, you know, Catherine Bigelow and say like, "Hey, uh, um I, you know, I saw, I saw a bunch of muzzle flashes on that take, you know, and um, and that would be bad. And they would refilm it <laughs> because they want to see him. So in this shot, here's a frame where he fires and we don't see the flash. We see the tail end of the flash. And so let's go back to. So 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 being a. Uh, where did where'd my little pistol guy go? Where'd you go, pistol? All right there. You go. OK, so 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 being a stew plug in. Um, we, we can actually do that. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have um, the flash age 
and we have this heat map delay, and they can kind of conspire to basically allow you to capture the flash at whichever moment in time you want, or you can just randomize it and have it be different on every frame, which which is a pretty amazing looking effect. Um, so here's flash age, and this is this is my favorite part of this entire yeah. plugin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Me, me too. Watch I was this. like, you can actually see little sparks coming out of it and everything. Yeah, yeah. We'll turn the sparks on so we can see that too. This I don't think this preset uses them, but yeah. So early on, <laughs> so uh. look what happens early on in the Flash's life. <laughs> first of all, it's bluer because it's hotter because Christian put in this uh, control, which is uh, where is it? Uh, um, uh, energy affects color temperature. <laughs> so, because all the particles have energy and the energy does it. So we have 80% energy affects color temperature, which means when the when the when they're super hot, they're both super bright and super blue. Amazing. So then we can move through the flash age and see the flash ah, gets so older cool. and dissipate yes. out. <laughs> and and then you can see it leave behind just its heat. <laughs> uh, that's so, so good. So of course everyone sees that and wants immediately to do like Trinity jumping out of the window and shooting back at the agent who's jumping out after her. And I just want to caution you against doing that because unless you're literally doing the matrix, which People still are. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, some what losers do a live entire live show. <laughs> these, these losers are still out there making videos. <laughs> I cannot wait for that oh, movie. So, movie. Um, so cool. Where is uh, I've got a little treat for you guys here. So hold on. Um, all right. So I was on the set of a movie where I was in charge of enough stuff and they left me alone with, uh, with enough toys that I was able to take a phantom camera and just photograph somebody shooting an AK-47. Um, Can you say what movie that was? This is, uh, this is a, this is an outtake from the spirit. That's what I thought. Uh, because Seth, you know that like my filmography is full of nothing but movies that <laughs> everyone loves. Um, hey, you worked on some Star Wars movies though. I <laughs> I did in, in everyone's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I took I took those beloved movies and I all right, made all right. Them even more. I set you up for that one. I apologize. That was that was a bad hosting <laughs> on my part. Um, so this is uh this I think I shot this at either eight hundred or kind of was the max that the um, Phantom would do at full HD, and um. So, uh, so what you see is that, um, you know, it's even at that speed, you know, and this is kind of some really useful reference for us to look at like the lifespan of a muzzle flash and really try to capture like what was special and interesting about it. Um, the, even at that speed, you're, you, the flash only lasts like three or four frames. So what that means is that right, you're a using a phantom. This is like really super slow motion, and the flash is still only there for a couple of frames. That's yeah, I mean, so look at the slow mo so slow -mo muzzle flashes are ridiculous. Is that what you're saying? Slow mo muzzle flashes are ridiculous, and this is like, you you please you gotta trust me on this one. And even if you're shooting 120 frames per second, 240 frames per second, a muzzle flash does not last longer than a frame. And if you make it last longer than a frame, the corridor guys will make fun of you. <laughs> like. <laughs> Sorry. So don't don't do it. <laughs> I love that that is the industry wide fear. Yes. Now, it's, it's like... Yeah. So uh, so this is so like I, I I have I have gone to great lengths to prove to you that that unless you go to great lengths, you really can't get a muzzle flash to last longer than a frame. So please, this is my use bang responsibly uh, admonishment here. Um, but yeah, so it was really fun to work with Christian and sit and look at reference like this to study. Um, you know, what, uh, what like the right, uh, you know, kind of way to treat this heat thing was. And, and of course, the way he did that is he just did a completely separate particle simulation for the heat. So and, and you can actually see that if you want. Um, uh, so let's go back to that. Uh, there's that flash age, we'll put that back in kind of the sweet spot. If you want to just see the particles that make up the the heat blur, you can also use it for some displacement as well. 
there's a little checkbox here you can say show heat blur which map. makes for its own cool so look on its own what, yeah, exactly. I, that was exactly what I told Christian. I'm like, if you want to leave that in there, people it's, are going to use this to make it's Reagan absolutely going to show up on YouTube, like in people's live videos. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and then the other thing that I think is kind of fun to talk about, right, is like why, like, how do you know? Look at this beautiful UI for like these these pedals, right? So really tempting to just turn this on and have the little fancy starburst of, of pedals around. Crank it up, gun. make them bigger. But this is, <laughs> this is another one where I have to like admonish folks to, to, you know, practice safe visual effects and, uh, and, and study. study you need an alert window right? that comes so, up. That's just your face. Like, nah, uh, uh, like, if you have the wireframe, if you have the wireframe for a pistol, you should not allow pedals to yeah. even show up. <laughs> All right, so I apologize. Oh no, for the that butt. lady! It's just flash by. <laughs> um, so another scene from Point Break, and this guy's firing a Steyr Og, which is the diehardest of all guns. So that's <laughs> so he he wins. Um, I love the idea that these guys, these like surfer bums, would have like a seven thousand dollar like European <laughs> assault rifle in their uh, arsenal. But you know, whatever. Um, it was it was the eighties, man. Um, so uh, so pedals. Why 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 do pedals? Um, I think I have where did that glorious reference go. Um, here we go. Okay. Oh, actually, I think I even pre. There we go. Okay. So, all right. So here's here's one of my little prop guns that is actually has a separate little flash suppressor. So this is just a Japanese airsoft gun of the second die hardest gun of, <laughs> of all time. That, yeah. H and K, uh, and so, um, so this is what the gun looks like. And if you were to fire bullets out of this gun, it would make a nice big round flash. But if you put this little doohickus on there, you can see that, um, six little veins through it, right? And so that is going to make for a six-pointed uh, star. So. Um, so let's see, where do we go for that? Oh, we go to the elevator. Okay, so so she's firing that exact prop, and so there's our six points. So this is like, this is fully sanctioned. You know, you are licensed to use the pedals. So if you want, if you want the pedals, you gotta you gotta uh, use a gun uh, or a gun that has uh, that has that little flash numbers of holes in them and. And that controls the number of the, the pedals that come out. And like heat is a great reference for this. There's some really beautiful uh, reference of uh, of how, how these kind of pedals uh, interact with, uh, with the muzzle flash there. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, a really fun example of. Yeah, this How kind cool. of knowledge is just, it's so delightful to have access to, honestly. Well, dude, that's what was so great about it. I don't know if you've read Stu's book. Uh, you have like a whole chapter on, in fact, on. Well, that's that's why I thought Christian it was, had just like tunneled inside of my brain. He probably just read my book and probably also was just incredibly smart on his own. And and so it's it, it's not it's not that much of a mystery, like how he got it to work. But like, yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, the sort of process of discovery of this stuff has been has been. Well, really I fun. remember on Go Bag, there's a there's a moment in one of the shorts, uh, the Red Giant shorts. There's a there's a scene where I had written that she's you know in this big old fist fight with these dudes, and then she grabs one of their gun, manages to grab one of their guns finally, and pulls the trigger, and and it's out of bullets. The old trope that it's out of bullets. Well, I've never used <laughs> a real gun before. Oh yeah, yeah. And you call me up and you're like, "Hey, Seth. So, uh, what's that about? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, what? What is this? What's happening in this scene? Why isn't the gun working?" I was like, "It's out of bullets." You were like, "Okay, you didn't read my book." And <laughs> you didn't say that, but you were like, "You were like, you know, I have a whole chapter in my book about how guns work." And uh, you pull out this like prop gun and start showing me, and I'm like, "Oh my god, there's no way I can fix this now." So there's an inexplicable moment in the movie where she pulls the trigger and it doesn't work, and it's not explained. And I learned the I learned the error of my ways. Yeah, that's like uh, so. 
when you have a gun, this is a fake gun, um, and it is out of bullets, so yep. that happens every time you shoot the gun. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but... Oh, let's, um, go, to, let's go to the gun close-up shot. Here we are. <laughs> um, all right, so, so every time it fires, this slide ratchets back, right? But on the clip, there's actually a little button that engages with the little notch in the slide, and that button is held down by the bullets. And when the last bullet is gone, that button pushes up, and the slide... Ow. Oh, no. <laughs> he shot himself. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> Safety you know first, what? everyone. Um, yes, the slide stays ratcheted back like that. The little button holds it in place. And when you do that, that's your clue that you should reload. So like that. You do, yeah. and then you you have a little nugget right there. You push it down with your thumb, and it does that. All of these are cool things to do, and in movies like by, you know, there's like, you know, Jim Cameron and stuff, you'll see actors just do all of that stuff. Or you'll see, the, like one of my favorite action movie moments, I'm embarrassed to say, was it Armor of God? I think Jackie Chan, like, somebody puts a gun in his face, and Jack, Jackie Chan doesn't just say, but, but he actually oh, yeah. thumbs down that slide and disassembles the gun because that step down there's another little there's this hey. little thing if you push that little thing down you the whole slide will just slide right off the so stream's gotten Chan very laggy and, the stream's gotten laggy yeah people are not getting to see these motions because it's just freezing up mm. Mm. let me figure out why just do you my the kids are home they're watching Netflix oh no the kids are <laughs> they can't be <laughs> uh well, I can do it. Millions are watching. Does not explain the lag. As we only have <laughs> watching. Well, we should keep talking guns, and I'll just start quitting things that use the internet. Um, this is your Robocop's gun, by the way. The Beretta ninety three uh, R, and uh, it is a full auto. Nine millimeter. It has beautiful flash uh, uh, suppressor built into the barrel, so it shoots fire. And they modified it by adding a big longer barrel to it uh, for Robocop to fire it. And they wanted the flash to look really cool, and so they added extra veins into that barrel extension that shoots fire gun without. Um, um, Without RoboCop's gloves on, you'd probably burn your hands because the gun is literally just hand. It's uh, when it's shooting, um, but it has a uh, it has a three round burst mode. So every time time he fires, you get three frames flash usually, or at least you're guaranteed to get you know you pr pretty good chance you're going to get one. So would see they pros through RoboCop and they'd be like, well, mine can too. No. <laughs> No, unless I know who's only appeared in Robocop and uh, Femnick in the firing range. Uh, why you couldn't I, see uh, Stu's I've guns. What, uh, I yes. actually think it's a memory issue. I think that our internet, my internet's fine. Uh, I think there's something weird going on with Maram or something. Maram. Hey, I what? I saw it for a second. Are you seeing anything on the thing? Um, for just a moment, we were in real time, and then, uh, and then we weren't on again, YouTube so, or on Skype. Right. Uh, Skype. I think on. Yeah, I think on both. Waving around. I mean, at least people can still hear but, us. Uh, the audio is fine. It's just the video that is. Yes, like... this is now a podcast, everybody. <laughs> All right, Stu. A, so describe a, a, the best medium for works. visual effects discussion. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, right, let me know if there's anything I can do to make it more better. Just, just um, moves over and and has a little too much whiskey and won't shut up about his uh, his his history <laughs> in the visual effects industry. Yes. Well, Seth, yeah. Are we gonna have to? Are we gonna have to restart? Or? I actually just restarted and started back again. Tell me if it fi- if it's still on the. It, hey, yeah, I see. It, Ooh, I think it I should see link to the same stream if I do that, and I just did it. Hey, I think I'm moving. Yeah. All right. I think that we are back, everybody. Yay. Which is delightful. Because we want to play around with some of these these wild effects and things that are that are happening. Yeah, I was gonna say we've we've got stuff to do now. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So um one of the things that uh, that I was curious to play around with um, is uh, you're related. Uh, I think that uh, if you don't know, we just released a new version of Trap Code Particular. And one of the things that I am tremendously excited about is the fact that we have now combined form and particular. And they both have such great functions for the types of effects that I like to do. And I've always lamented having to not being able to tie those two together and have them exist in the same 3D space. But my wish came true this week. And so I want to play around with trying to create a tornado uh, using this new function. Because I would love to have a tornado form because it would be a static or, you know, a, a permanent array of particles doing their own thing without uh, dying. But I would love to have debris that are that have a specific life cycle or maybe fall off or bounce on the ground or are blown around. There, there are a million things I want to experiment with. To uh, try that out. I'm excited. I'm going to allow you to see it in just a second. As soon as I. Sorry, guys. The, I was fixing the stream and then my AirPods cut out, and so I couldn't hear you for a little bit. So I've just been nodding and smiling, hoping that. <laughs> you were Keanu looping. Yeah. I'm just doing this. Classic. Uh, so I just halfway through the stream decided, remembered that I have a really fun shot from an action movie kid that I never finished, but it is James running through a field and it's motion tracked and he's rotoed already. So, Oh, um, our favorite parts to watch and it's already been done. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm sorry that you won't be able to see the the roto process though. You will have to see me try to uh, find my, uh, my rotoed files. They gotta be around here somewhere. All right. I'm going to dig that up. I've got your AE a- on screen now, so hopefully we should be. Excellent. So, yeah, here I have this uh, fun uh, scene. Uh, I had previously used it to um, for this short that I had filmed with James. That I, I still really like the idea of the short. I just haven't been able to finish it. So, um, in the meantime, I ended up using it to do this um, 1917 kind of... Uh, spoof shot a while ago because it was it was already tracked and and that's always kind of lovely let me see if i can uh, pull up uh, that to loop in the background while i look for the rotoed footage here uh where would i have saved it probably around here maybe oh yeah i'll just i'll, I'll loop this over here i don't think it's going to play the sound but uh Whoops, pardon me. Fitting that on screen. Whoops, maybe it's playing a sound. I don't know if you're hearing it. I'm not hearing the sound. Okay, good. I forgot you did this. So I used it to kind of spoof on this, uh, this shot before. And... Previously, before that, it was supposed to be this uh, shot from this uh, short that was based on a Viewmaster come to life, where James, where the dinosaurs from a Viewmaster had come alive, and 
all James had the ability to do was pull the trigger, which would switch it to a different type of dinosaur uh, in real life chasing him. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm going to try to add something to this, but I really want to find my Rotoed James first. Uh, what else do we think we're going to do today? Well, there's a couple things. So I wanted to, you know, we were talking about Bang and how it's one, like, I noticed it's if you leave it on and don't click the the Bang button, the add keyframe button, it does this like flickery, mm-hmm. fractally, like, you know, it looks, it, it looked like something specific and I couldn't figure out what it was until middle of the night. I wake up in a sweat and I'm like, Force Awakens! And it's that first shot. Woke up the wife, woke up the kids. I woke up everyone and told all of them. I called you. You were yeah. awake because you don't sleep. And and it's that, it reminds me of that shot where in Force Awakens where, uh, which by the way, I don't think we give Force Awakens enough credit for the fact that right off the bat, it's just like doing stuff you've always wanted to see in Star Wars, like in a but in a really great story context. And the it's when the stormtrooper no uh, Oscar Isaac's character fires uh, the blaster at Kylo Ren and he turns and force stops it, and then the phaser blast is just hovering in the air and flickering, and. So cool. It made me think of that. In love with that stuff. So cool. And so I... It, you know what? Can we? Can I interject? Because that is just like... That's like the magic of J.J. Abrams. Like, he is also living inside your head. And he's like, hey, Seth, I also always wondered what it would look like if you could face exactly. frame a blast bolt in midair. That's why that first one's so good. So let's just do yeah. it because they put me in charge. And now we can just do it. Let's go yeah. do it. And that's why that first one he did is so freaking great is because he's just like, it's like that first Pirates movie where they're just like, well, we're never going to get to make a pirate movie again. Let's do everything we've ever wanted to see in a pirate movie all in one movie. Totally. Um yeah. Except tentacle beards. Let's save that for the next one. <laughs> save tentacle beards. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to have one of these, uh, have one of these muzzle flashes just hover in the air and see how it looked and just recreate this, which you don't even need bang to do this, but if you can do it with bang. So I've, I took, I took a shot with cam track AR real quick earlier while Stu was talking. You can see me actually do it. If you roll back in the show, um, <laughs> which imports it does a lidar scan no no yeah i don't know what it does it does no ar it says an AR, ar tracking while it films and then imports the camera track with the plate into after effects and uh and so now i've got a muzzle flash just hovering in the middle of the air I, that's how we did the twister shot too that's just, so it was the same pipeline. oh same pipeline same <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah so i'm yeah. going to uh I'm just going to try this real quick. And then I thought I might, because other stuff came out this week, uh, besides bang, which is cool. We got a bunch of particular new stuff in particular. I thought I'd try to make a tornado again. I've done it a million times. I've tried a million times and never been able to f- quite crack it. So I figured I might just be over here fiddling with tornadoes while Hashi does his stuff. Oh man. Let's see. Right now I'm trying to find a roto plates, which are probably on a bit. This is this is why I prep for the show. Yeah, it's so we can get two hours of us looking for old plates. <laughs> on yeah, if you don't get to see me do the rotor, you'll you'll watch me look for it. <laughs> Stu, what are you doing? Uh, I got I I, I I'm uh, ready to talk about RoboCop. All right, if you guys I'm need, switching over to little, RoboCop. Oh show man, me, oh, right, show me RoboCop. some things. You're on screen, it's Mr. Sulu. All right, cool. So, um, so, so when. When RoboCop fires his gun, it's that modified real gun. But when Ed 209 fires his gun, <laughs> ah. um, so, you know, oh, Ed 209 is a stop motion. Ed. What's that? My favorite Ed. Yeah, he's the best of the Eds. Uh, named after Ed Newmeyer, the producer of the, the film, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, so, uh, the... Um, these muzzle flashes, so, so Ed 209 is a stop motion puppet animated by uh, Phil Tippett. And you might be saying, hey, Stu, if he's stop motion, why does he have motion blur? And I will tell you the answer to that question. It is because Phil Tippett has a little string attached to the model and is wiggling it during the exposure because he's a crazy, crazy person. Isn't the, other method, uh, bump, isn't the other method bumping the table or drumming on the table while uh, it takes? Yeah, I... 
probably some combination of depending on the action or the you know the the direction that it needed can to i interject yes. with a very very dumb uh, joke that came up with other red giant employees a few years ago when we went to see that kubo exhibit and we all oh, got, yeah. got to talking about go motion which is i think what phil Tippett calls the process of which he creates motion blur and we were yeah. like well what exactly is it and we look it up and it's like the string and it's sometimes bumping the table and we were like that's just a drunk stop motion animator that's just a like <laughs> I, this yeah. came up because some stuff and we, then we talked about how great a stop motion short would be if it was uh if you did if, if it was basically a stop motion film but then like beer bottles were just kind of collecting in the frame at a certain point and then after a while it like started to be all the frames in between when they would hit the frame and it was basically what if you told the story yes. <laughs> what if you told the story of a stop motion animator who was whose life was breaking down as they made the film but only through the perspective of their lens <laughs> oh i love it anyway yeah go motion is strictly speaking refers to the process of actually using um uh, you know, stepper motors, like basically motion control gear that traditionally would be used to spin a little spaceship or move oh, okay. a camera around a stationary spaceship uh, on the movie uh, Dragon, not yeah. Heart, but Dragon oh, Slayer. Slayer. Um, uh, yeah, because right? Dragon Heart was uh, the I Am the Lost one. one. CG one. Yeah, he's yeah he's he's the CG one. Um, I still love I Go Hard for Dragon Heart. I love we that. all go hard for Dragon yeah, Heart. Yeah, it's... <laughs> That was uh, that was the movie I didn't work on, so I could work on Mission Woo. Impossible. But um, uh, the the uh, but yeah, this they couldn't afford proper go motion on Robocop, so Phil just did it the old fashioned way, uh, which is makes it all the more magic to me. So um, so just so we all kind of understand how stop motion works, right? We move the puppet, we take a frame. We move the puppet, we take a frame. But in this case. This background is a projection, right? So, the, so there's no set here. There's there's a there's a plate of the background that was shot on location, uh, and then um, a, and then it was project rear projected behind this little model of Ed Two Hundred Nine, and so that's a separate exposure because uh, it needs different light values. Uh, so different exposure times. So there's a lights off on Ed, background up exposure then there's beauty lighting on ed exposure and all this is happening while uh phil is just standing there waiting hoping that the lights all turn on and no, no bulbs burn out and whatever and then and then on the flash frames he's got a little socket in each of these guns that can take a little grain of wheat bulb this is pre-led and so you stick a little grain of wheat like christmas light in there and he would then sculpt a little cotton muzzle flash and stick it over. So now the lights are off on Ed. The lights are off in the background. Uh, he's got you know an exposure wedge, so he knows the right shutter time for uh, these muzzle flash frames. And he takes this frame. And on some of these frames, you can actually see what look like little hairs. Oh of, my gosh! <laughs> of the flat of the, and it's so magic. And um, you know, if they didn't want, by the way, if they didn't want to see the perceived sort of like distinctness of the cotton, they had various techniques they could do. They could put a diffusion filter in for just that pass or do multiple exposures. So do uh, let a little light in, close it down again, re-sculpt the cotton a little bit, get one more exposure out of it so that you get a little cross dissolve between two slightly differently fluffed versions of the cotton ball. So That is amazing. And then go back and be wow. like, oh yeah, and wait, which how which part of him was moving where? And oh, I did I forget to jiggle him with the string? And <laughs> and, and all of this, by the way, is without having any kind of uh, video preview of this. You know, now when they're making like Kubo and whatever, they're as you know they're shooting with the Dragon Frame software, which is amazing stop motion software, uh, and they are seeing the shot and they can actually go back <laughs> like if they're like oh I screwed something up, they can go back ten frames, reline up the puppet, and just pick it up and start filming again. Uh, Phil did not have that luxury. You know, he's laying this all down a frame at a time. So, and then just to like appreciate the beautiful staging of this as he's firing that shot's real short. And then the very next shot is just all pure live action. You see the flashes going. That's just practical effects before the stunt double comes flying through. There's no Ed back there, but you saw the, you know, the Ed should be where those flashes are, but he's not, but you don't care because you are so in the movie at this point. And, and RoboCop's getting rocked, 
the staging of this scene, you're going to have to stop me from talking about it because nope. it's nope. just so insane. No one's stopping. <laughs> um, so I have a little, I don't know if my camera is still up, but I have this glorious little toy at 209. It's like kind of a uh, uh, fancy larger model of Ed 209. And I wanted to experiment with this in the context of Bang and try to channel a little bit of that glory of, of, of Phil and company. Um, so I shot, um, I shot these, I shot just this nice still, just locked off still. And then I shot interactive light passes for each side of him. So I just made a little diorama out of my Pelican case. Wait, go back here. to the, go back to the first shot you took. Cause it looks like an AO pass. It doesn't even look like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I did use a big soft light, and I kind of had the same reaction. Like, I took this photo, and I thought, well, that's just beautiful. Like, I, why is yeah. it so pretty? I don't know. He's just, it's a magical design. Like, he's a gloriously beautiful thing. I, I Ed 209 is, like, my favorite buddy. Um, <laughs> so here's what the interactive light passes look yeah. like. He's so friendly. Yes. You could he's so, yeah, so he's, friendly. He's just your butt. Yeah. Well, take him to the office. You know, by the way... It, it, if you're interested in the history of this VFX stuff, like get the Cinefix Classic app on your iPad and download the issue. Is it still functioning? Of, the, of this, you know, long out of print. Um, it's 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 working fine on iOS 14. It's got some bugs on iOS 15. So if you haven't upgraded to the public beta of iOS, do 15, do we know how long that's gonna last? Now that they're, you know what I. If, I don't care whose lawn I have to stand on just, with what boombox. Just I'm buy an iPad, like an yeah. old iPad, never update it. Just yeah, so you never connect it to the internet. To just download them all. It's cheaper than buying the back issues on, on uh, eBay. <laughs> Although someone uh, in this thread, Robocop someone Cinefix. in our comments is selling is selling a chunk of Cinefix. I guarantee you between all of us, we could we could acquire an entire collection and somehow. Look yeah, at it's, it's, an, it's such an important historical thing. At some point, like it's just got to go into the Library of Congress. Yeah. Like, but the issue on Robocop is spectacular because they don't just talk about the effects. They talk a lot about the, pro the, the production itself. Um, and that you, you hear about the design of Ed 209 and why he has this big radiator grill. Uh, obviously, it's to make him look scary, make him look like a shark or like an orca or something like that. But it's also an intentionally stupid design. They intentionally made this massive vulnerability right in his front you know so like obviously you know like for if this if he's like a car it, it's you know it's a it's just a, a detroit story right so he's supposed to look like a big dumb american car that comes to life and wants to murder you and it's like intentionally stupid design and when i read that <laughs> my little young mind just exploded with glee at like how quietly brilliant robocop is even when it's being so loudly brilliant some um, of our viewers might not be aware of what a Cinefix is. <laughs> as they're asking about it. Well, in that the sucks. Could you, so, Michael, could it's you, made of uh, paper. Help make so their life better. There. Uh, paper is made for the pulping process where they take a tree. So, trees, let's back up. A, oh, sorry. Oh, you there? Oh. I am. I was going to stop talking. And let Michael, I felt like I had inappropriately interrupted Michael. In the oh, no, that's what you do to Michael. You're supposed to inappropriately oh, okay. interrupt him while he's trying to give the people <laughs> no, real just, information. Was, yes. Cinefix <laughs> was, is uh, an amazing uh, physical magazine. And it you, was, might to, you might need to describe yeah. magazines. Well, that's why I was going back to trees. Yeah. Here. I think uh, trees were a good place to start. Yeah. They are... Uh, these, uh, they're a really cool journal. You can tell that they're you kind do. of thick. Are those all Dragonheart issues? Like, no, they're not. It'd be funny if they were all Dragonheart issues. And what's nice is that these are kind of behind the scene visual effect journals that don't do the, uh, they're not pandering to an entertainment audience. They are specifically getting into the nitty gritty of a visual effects artist. So they will talk about the laborious process of modeling something or building it or things that worked or didn't work out during the process. They'll interview uh, people about all the things that went poorly along the way. Uh, there are usually spoilers in them, so uh, make sure you've seen the movie first. They'll say like... <laughs> and here's how we did it, yeah. 
Sure. Hey, before I try to do a tornado, by the way, I want to bring to light. Uh, oh, <laughs> we both have it up, Hush. Um, yeah. Oh, do we both? Okay. Uh, our own Michael has. Uh, he created a tornado already. He did. He cracked it, and yeah. it looks oh, rad as hell. So this is this past April. Let me tell you. So yeah, the the vast majority of this is just fractal noise with the off uh, with the perspective offset turned on. Uh, sorry, I should say VR fractal noise, so there's no seam, and right. then just animating it going this way on CC cylinder. So I'm just moving the fractal CC noise on a cylinder, cylinder and it just makes the whole thing look like it's rotating. But then I took Hashi's technique to make the drone, uh, where he put oh, that, he did that whole crazy yeah. technique on a sphere. Yeah. I used it on a cylinder to give that extra 3D depth on the edges. So, so it's just good. fractal noise on a CC cylinder with rough and edges, both animated to make it look like it's going this way. And then I put I used Hashi's technique to add that little extra puffiness to the outside. And of course, trap code particular for the debris at the base of the tornado. Now I should say, for any weather nerds, that sometimes tornadoes in this hemisphere do spin that way, even though it's very rare. They do occasionally spin this direction in this hemisphere. But you don't know, I could have been doing a tornado in a different hemisphere. So hush, Michael, weather nerds, it's possible, or I could have Michael, been doing it somewhere else. I, I have like five things I need to slam my fist on the table about from all of that. You need to talk slower so I can respond passionately in response to the things you're I'm saying. Sorry. Go ahead. In in time with them. Good lord, this is so good. And you're, uh, <laughs> I actually, my favorite part is your, uh, is your weather uh, afterward, your epilogue about uh, about said tornado. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I felt that this direct this the spin direction was more arti- like since it was moving uh, from screen yeah. left to screen right, I wanted the spin to be going from screen right to screen left is more visually appealing. Um, but the answer is it could physically be doing that, um, even though it. They tend not to. Like 95% of the time, tornadoes in this hemisphere spin the opposite direction. Well, this is it. You did it. I've been wanting to figure out how to do this just in After Effects for years, and it was right there all along. Oh, yeah. It's so simple. It's so simple. So it's just a solid layer, obviously. Uh, Fractal noise uh, with the um, the button for uh, perspective offset checked, and then animate the noise going one direction. And then CC cylinder, mess with the lighting to make it look, you know, soft. And then I used, uh, I can't remember if it was Mesh Warp or Bezier Warp to make the tornado's yeah. shape change. And then, like I said, Hashi's technique to get those extra puffs. And then, of course, Particular to get the debris flying up at the bottom. I keyframed how much particles of which kind were coming out. So it was the full thing. You could see it hit a building and then go through a field, then hit another building at the end. Because you, you see bursts of debris coming up. I'm just using the fluid physics in Particular to make that happen. Yeah. So cool. And uh, Magic Bullet looks to add, you know, a look to the whole thing and universe camera shake because, you know, what's an action scene without some movement. Now, Stu, you did. Yeah, mm-hmm. I see what you're doing on your screen. I'm going to come over to you. Can you show that to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's um, where are you? Hey, you guessed. Here you are. Yeah, so back when I did that crazy sort of Twitter thread about the history of the spinning house shots in Twister, I, I did kind of want to make some commentary about um, how far visual effects technology has come since then. So I'm not sure <laughs> uh, why this isn't looping better, but... Uh, uh, Is it in Teams? No, it's not. <laughs> teams hates yeah. looping. Teams uh, hates fun. Go. It's like, oh yeah, um, let me know you want to turn this GIF off after seeing it once. Yeah, so kind of in the middle of doing this thread, I was just like, uh, like, oh yeah, I could, uh, I could try to make a, a tornado and twister. So wow. That's my, that's my, uh, that's my particular, that's my particular tornado with sort of a separate particular to blow. How big are the particles in front of us? They're big. They're that's what I they're thought. they're chunky. And you're just getting you know, like like these contours here. You're seeing donkey are, boys. Yeah, they're chunky boys. They're 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 cloudlets, you know, which has that great sort of that's interactive the lighting thing, cheat. The thing, right? the so, early mistake that I made, like in trying to create smoke or or dust in, with particular, was going small and thinking it needs to be tons and tons and tons, like the bang, you know, flashes. Like it needs to be tons and millions of small particles, but it doesn't. It just needs to be big old cloudlets with like one percent opacity and shadowlets like layered up, and then you get something really nice looking. Well, and I, 
Yeah, I genuinely did take that inspiration from the real work on Twister because, they, you know, they couldn't render millions and millions of particles. And so what they would do is they do particle instancing. So it is almost mm -hmm. exactly what uh, what what cloudlets are, where each particle is a is each particle that is simulated is a clump of additional particles. Um, and uh, so I just want to I love this because I mean, a tornado is just particles is all a tornado is. It's wind blowing stuff around. Yeah, and I've always loved this kind of like pyroclastic look, and it's just kind of shocking to me how good Particular can make it look with the shadow lits, you know. So I kind of wanted to just celebrate like how fun it is to be able to do the interactive lighting, which was oh yeah, that lighting is gorgeous. Yeah, it's 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 it was a fun fun little project, and then yeah, you know, you just you throw a little magic bullet mojo on there and a little camera shake, and I added a little windshield, and uh, you know. Fun little project. Hey, I made my blaster. Here's my little my floating blaster beam just sitting in the air. That is oh. it's so good. <laughs> I love it. It's just sitting there waiting for Kylo's. Yeah, I would. I break. think the original had a little bit of a direction blur on it. Uh, uh, maybe, but dude, that looks so good. I actually, oh, I actually made really that a cool. while back. I made that. I not by a while back. I mean like whenever I said, Hey, I'm going to open this up and make this, I, it took me like 30 seconds. <laughs> so it's just been playing here. So you guys can recreate force awakens with bang all you want or do cool floating things. It's even funnier with the gun. What are, what are you doing for the, uh, mo <laughs> the, the motions from the, uh, AR? Yeah, track, it's from right? the camera. I just turned, it was, I was tired of it trying to, uh, well, the truth was it shot it at 60 frames per second. I was tired of rendering 60 frames and also it looked gross and mm -hmm. so I switched the comp to 2397 and just turned my plate off because then my plate looked like garbage. User error had awesome. nothing to do with Bang. Oh, lovely. Well, now that I've seen like, seen way better tornadoes, uh, I'm going to try to demo a new feature of uh, Particular. Are you going to try the, the, uh, the flocking the tornado then? Um, I was just going to try... Uh, creating a, a a form object in particular, okay. and then adding separate emitters and things like that. But no, no, you that's wanted, no. You, you have, do uh, well. Yeah, uh, you do that. I'll, that sounds. Are you sure? Yeah, you. You. It sounded like you had a you had a plan to try. No, through, no. So... I think that your plan sounds sensible, and mine. So why don't you do the sensible thing, and I'll do the thing that won't work. All right, so it's a competition to see who can who can break our our new feature <laughs> the most spectacularly. Well, I think I did it on the three D motion show. If you go back and watch it, so I beat you to it. But oh, lovely! So so many of you are familiar with Trapcode Particular. Uh, we use it all the time. Uh, I am here in the designer window, and uh, what I'm going to do in here is. Uh, like I said last week, it's always really fun to get your motion working first before you get into all the details of everything. And I would like the uh, emitter in this case to not be uh, a single point. I'd like it to be a 3D model. And uh, we'll select a little 3D model from the uh, library here. I'm going to go with, uh, let's see. Where we got it. I think that we have just a standard cone in here. I was going to say, you're, you're scrolling past uh, a new uh, one other feature that no, we don't even have talked about, that there's new models just in the library now, barred from the oh, yeah. asset library. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a whole there's new humans, section of models human to base torsos and heads. Stuff off. Humans, faces. Which I thought it'd be cool fun heads. to track that face onto my face and do like a, I'm dissolving thing and haven't had time to. <laughs> I've had so that's a free one for you sense. folks in the chat. You can take that idea and run with I'm it. I'm dissolving. You have to use that audio. I'm <laughs> Yes, you do. So here I have an array of particles that are yeah, emitting from a 3D object. Big deal. We knew it could do that. Big but deal. right here under emitter behavior, I can change this to being a form object, which is really great because now these particles are permanent they live in this array and i can kind of work with them they don't need to die over time i can just kind of create a group of them like this and what's fun about that is that now i can mix it in 3d space for example i'll just do a really bad example um 
let's see. Uh, let's change these to a different color just for fun. Whoops. Actually, I was, I was going to say, in case you didn't know, you did not change the color. <laughs> Aww. So, so here we go. Uh, we now have a the ability to... Oh, you know, my scene is a motion tracked one, so it's trying to orbit around the center. But I can now have a particle system and a form system that interact. So, for example, if these particles were uh, larger, uh, watch this. So if these were, uh, yeah, thick particles, you could see the little red ones poking through and coming out of them. Little Christmas tree emitting stuff. And uh, just like Seth was mentioning earlier, using a f just a few particles with shadowlets on, you get a really quick read of something that is kind of volumetric. So I really like this. And I also love that to this, I could, uh, well, first of all, let's, let's rotate it upside down. Uh, I'm going to disable this other system here. Let's delete that. And another new feature of Particular, uh, right now this is called the primary system, but I can go down here and say rename a system. So I could call this the main tornado or something like that. And now I'll know what system that is if I want to turn it on or off later. And uh, here in the emitter um, arrangement, I will go ahead and turn this thing upside down a bit. While there Arsh we go. is doing that, I just want to do a quick rundown of my favorite things in the new version of Particular. Besides the fact that you've got Form pretty much brought over, it also brought over Kaleidospace from Form, which is the ability to mirror in 3D space your particles on X, Y, or Z, or uh, any mix of those. But you can have child em particles emitting from those mirrored systems that aren't mirrored. So you can have like a real symmetrical, for example, uh, firework going off that's perfectly symmetrical but then the smoke blows left to right across the screen or you know things like that also updates to the to the uh, flocking you can now set um, predator prey stuff happens when the predator and prey come in contact with each other which is going to open up a lot of cool options you can you know kill things you can emit things it's great and uh, teams now so you can have predator and prey on separate teams so you so can emit cool. yeah, you can emit that's predators the fun from part. prey so you can have like space battles between parts. It's, it's, oh, I'm yeah, so excited. We, the first thing we all there, did was yeah. make space battles uh, uh, with those. Yes. 100%. And then the next thing was, I was like, the second I saw Harry doing something where he was like disintegrating a form like uh, emitter with a whole bunch of like, you know, phaser shots, I was like, oh boy. And so I, if you watch my 3D motion show tutorial, I quickly was like, how can I use this to disintegrate things and make them bleed? And uh, it's a lot of fun to play with, for sure. Oh, man. I was just curious what this would look like. I want. I really wanted the to try uh, tree. seeing what, what, what fluid motion looked like. Um, so uh, back here, uh, when you can add form to particular, you have the option to use classic form, which is uh, form kind of as you know it, or you can use dynamic form. And that will allow me to do things like enabling my fluid simulation and here i'm enabling the vortex tube style uh, which i can uh, change the region size to be kind oh, of wider dude, than this it's shockingly awesome oh yeah it's so easy i'm actually using the same exact technique on a music video that we're currently in post-production on for a rapper most of our chat has probably heard of Ooh. mc tornado i just made oh, that guy geez. up it's not him <laughs> why did you pluck that dumb joke right out of mc brain tornado then, like, like <laughs> well you... the the no, seriously, like that, those words were floating to the forefront here's, of my brain. And then you like secret service, like took here's that the difference of experience. Like, I'll say it. That's too dumb. Yeah. The difference, the difference here is you didn't say it. I did. <laughs> that's what, that's yeah. what makes you great. Yeah. And me, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to try to move this relative position down here. So it's spinning the bottom. Maybe I thought I've top. had weird luck with Dow lately. I wasn't I even was, going to oh, go ahead. Oh, I wasn't even going to do simulations, but now well, I'm just really I wondered with I the vortex love... stuff if it would do anything. But it's just you lack a little bit of control that I would want because I like the bendy, windy tornado, uh, like the one, the one, the like the like basically seventy percent of the ones in Twister. Um, 
I've forgotten mm-hmm. all of my meteorology terms that I learned, like when Twister came out. Um, they didn't stick as well as the dinosaur terms did after Jurassic. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I thought maybe I'll tr- I'll start playing around with Dow. But the, I, the one thing that's messing me up is like, I, do you guys know how to get better tapering in Dow? Because I don't. It just looks like like a sausage. Like it's just. <laughs> Hey, that that's your that's the wheelhouse. Yes. I, I love it. Um, I I don't actually know uh, how to how to do oh, that. To be honest, so um, screw that. Yeah, this is where we all publicly admit that we, we are confused by like the power and amazingness of. It's Dow. true. I mean, I managed to make meat tubes the last the, a few weeks ago that didn't look too bad. That was awesome. Uh, yeah. I th- I guess I, I I got too cocky. The meat tubes made me cocky. <laughs> as they do so if you want to throw me up on the second I screen I'm having it's just about to ask tonight. what you're doing yeah um, you're up so I got so what I was just having fun with here was um, setting up this is my favorite thing I picked the the. so we have all these different little wireframe guns that match different presets and it just it made felt hilarious to give Ed a little revolver <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can you add a real one i want him holding a real i'd like hashi to divert his energy to now putting a tiny revolver in ed's hand oh my god he's got his gun hands that he's using to hold <laughs> six shooter yeah uh so this really shows you the power of uh <laughs> sorry that took a second michael for it to get into my head it's <laughs> sorry um so this shows you the, the the glory of um uh using um a flash age random right because each of these flashes now is just so radically different from one another and i tried to kind of i tweaked a, a preset that to make it look a little bit more like the cotton ball but i'm getting nice randomness and then i'm gonna go down oh, here and switch so good, to Stewie. it looks so good <laughs> i'm gonna switch to um i turned highlight roll off all the way down so i'm getting the full hdr and i'm gonna switch to compositing this over black and i'll just add it together with the other one so now here are his two guns but they're both um they're both on the same uh, random seed, so I just need to change that on one of them. And now I've got two guns that are have all the same properties, but are at different uh, different randomizations. You can see we've got sparks in this preset, which which I'm loving because it actually makes me think of the cotton. So there's these little like highly motion blurred like hot sparks that come firing out of each of the blasts. They're I love so that. cool. Um, so I don't know how interesting this is going to be, but I was thinking I would try to use, um, these, so I'm going to composite these flashes back over Ed, but then I'm also going to use, um, the brightness of the flashes and the glow to, to mat the interactive light passes so that the flashes become, uh, like we have an interactive light feature built into bang, but I've got these interactive light passes for my little plastic model. So I'm going to try to, uh, Use so the chat was asking about sparks in Bang, and I just wanted to show. Look, there's a spark right there. Yeah, look, there. Yeah, it's spark. it's really fun. You have um you have total control over it here, so you've got a whole little section for sparks. You've got max sparks, so we can just crank it up and have uh, lots and lots. The of hero sparks. of my detective novel. Max sparks. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um. Uh, so that's too many sparks, but yeah, they're little separate particles that are rendered on these little motion blurred streaks. So. Uh, they can be added to any preset, but they um, and they have you have spark dispersion and spark brightness, so you got nice little control over them. Uh, control. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's one of the like, like I, I knew Bang was good, but then I started messing with it. I was like, this is so fast and easy to get a decent yeah. muzzle flash. Like you could use this if you were. I, I thought about it because we were talking with the, one of the uh, stunt coordinators on free guy and i was like you can use this on set like when you're choreographing an action scene you know you could you could use it on set because you got to send that to the director to say here's the action scene do you like how it plays and you can have nice you could quickly quickly throw in real good lens you know muzzle flashes from your guns there but it's got all of this power you could use it in the final production as well because you've got control over all of the things i love it so much it, ah, it gives me so excited okay oh, okay awesome. calm yeah, down I, michael I, I'm not. I'm not allowed to give specifics, but that that is literally happening on a very gun-y movie that is in production right now. 
Uh, oh yes, they're using it on the the stunt viz and in the uh, VFX editorial phase for uh, for previs. It's a very gun movie. Uh, very gunny movie. Very excited about it's it. The gunniest of movies. <laughs> It's gun the movie. Uh, we'll so, come out and say they're making a movie based on <laughs> based on <laughs> the invention of the gun. Directed by James Gunn. Gun, the motion picture. Uh, so I'm gonna pre comp this little cam left uh flash situation here and then figure out what to do about that. So there he is. And then what I'm gonna do is put a big old uh optical glow on him. Optical glow. We have built-in glow, but I'm going to go crazy with it because this is not to be the glow. This is to be the mat for the interactive light. So it is going to be stupid. And then I have... Let's see, so it's camera left, interactive light pass. So I'm just going to take this and multiply this over the interactive light pass. So now, so now this is the interactive light kind of modulated by the, uh, by the glow. Maybe I don't need quite so much of it here. So then I'll go back to my symbol here. And I will, so I guess this is camera left, interactive light. All right, and then, oh no, I need the flashback. This is why I know in pre-comps, because it makes tutorials impossible to follow. There, Don't forget to touch on interactive lights as well, because uh, there's been a lot of questions in the chat, I think, about how the interactive light in that hero video was working. Yeah, yes. well, let's, let's talk about the actual feature of the, of the plugin here. So um, basically all you need for interactive light to work is you just need uh, a mat for whatever you, your sort of foreground is, which is, which, is, is shockingly easy to create because oftentimes, you know, the flash only exists for a handful of frames, yeah. or even if like in this shot, it goes on for the entire duration of the shot. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have to be that exact. Right. So, um, so what I did is I did the, 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 the cheapest and simplest, like, I think I did one keyframe of, of, uh, of paint strokes for this, um, this roto brush here and I got, you know, you can see the edge is a little fuzzy, but that's going to totally be fine for what we need here. You can see a little bit of the background through there. It, it's totally okay. Cause nobody is, nobody is looking that close. So this is just a separate layer in, in my comp. I can just turn it off and then I've got bang applied here and we have some really nice controls for this. So, um, so you just pick go down here to, uh, Interactive light, twirl it open. So I just picked that roto brush mat uh, layer, and I'm just going to make sure it has effects and masks uh, enabled, so I get it post post roto brush. And then you just have this interactive light amount, and it's going to. Uh, oops, where did it go? Interactive light amount. There you go, buddy. Um, yeah. So crank it up. Um, but we have a little bit of extra control over it. So we have um, interactive light size, so you can control kind of the radius of it. And then we have this neat control here, restrict to mat. So if I set that to zero, basically it's going to ignore the layer and do the interactive light like all over the shot. And the thing is we kind of noticed, like when you'd go to set up your interactive light and you wouldn't have your right layer picked, we'd actually noticed that this was actually kind of cool. Like maybe the forest is too far away from him to really be lit up with this, but like in a shot uh, like this, you know, she's right up against that wall. Like the interactive light really would be hitting the wall. I happen to have practical interactive light for this example. Um, but uh, uh, but for uh, this shot, uh, there we go. Um, I would maybe put um, restrict to mat uh, at something other than 100%, right? So uh, so restrict to mat at 100% is going to only let the interactive light light up his where his mat is, but I'm going to put it at like, you know, 75. So I'm just getting a little bit of interactive light, eh, maybe 80. I'm doing a little interactive light on the background. 
And what's so nice about this is that it's entirely driven off of all the other controls. So if I change the color of the flash, like make it a little less orange, the interactive light goes with it. And if I have a high degree of, let's say, brightness random cranked up a lot so that I've got a lot of different amounts of brightness depending on the, uh, um, the frame or uh, even you saw how the brightness really got affected by the age of the flash. So if I have flash age random cranked up as well, um, I'm going to get the correct amount of interactive light on each frame. So even if I have practical interactive light built in, I still use this because it's just so easy and it just adds just a little bit. You know, what you, what you really don't want this to do is just look like a pop of a thing that doesn't have any interaction or any sort of integration with the rest of the shot. And so all of these things that we added are just designed to give it a little bit more real life interactivity. That is so lovely. <laughs> And yeah, honestly, the, it's Bang is so fast to add to something, and it, both lightsabers and muzzle flashes, for some reason, I hate having to spend any time doing. Oh, I know. Yeah. I, like, I don't know, like, or, or laser blast. I don't know what it is about them. I mean, they're, they're very simple in, no, but in like, essence. Yeah, but like, so to just add more. To waste time on. So like, so here I've actually got keyframes set up for the position of the gun, right? So if I advance to the next interactive light frame, you can just see this is the process to do this frame, right? I'm going to put the nose of the gun here. I'm going to grab the back until the sight lines up here. And then I'm going to click this add keyframe button. And then I'm going to move on to the next interactive light frame. So here it is. Move, move, add keyframe, next. So I don't know, man, if we could have made it any easier than this, I, I am I am not aware of how we could have possibly <laughs> made it any easier or faster than this. Uh, no, really, that's so great. This is my job. <laughs> <laughs> Shooting. People How's the tornado coming? Uh, oh, a tornado is uh, moving. I'm, I get so mesmerized. <laughs> yeah, by the lovely uh, VFX chat. So uh, yeah, let me show you what I got here. Um, so uh, let's see, where did you go? Um, none. Wait, did I turn off the effect or something? Ah. <laughs> um, so I just really quickly uh, have attached my uh, little array of particles to a little null so it's animating and chasing behind him like a a sentient little tornado which is very silly right now and uh i think the next couple of things that i want to do uh i've put an expression on the twist uh property of this uh this particular array uh, i might turn up the uh, number of particles or maybe at least the size of the particles here because that's a really cool effect. I'm going to maybe make them uh, gray or something like that. Let's see, where'd my picker go? There we go. Yeah, I was going to make this a real cartoony uh, tornado, I think. <laughs> uh, first of all, one of the things going on here that I really like is that this is a very broad daylight kind of uh, shot. So all I'm doing is taking this uh, really foggy horizon picture and putting it on a 3D card way back here and turning its opacity not all the way up. And uh, it kind of makes for that uh, weird tornado weather thing, like where you could have maybe sun here, but there's this sweeping in storm of stuff in the background. Uh, so here's the tornado. It doesn't yeah, ignore the lighting, but uh, let's see, maybe I could, I could add in a light here. That's really good visual effects advice, Hashi. Ignore, Ig the, ignore light. the lighting, ignore the animation. <laughs> Put all your effort into the sound effects. Which, if you're a real actor, will only be made with your mouth and hands. Yes. It's not real Foley if it comes from a live. I'm writer. loving the cartoony tornado, by the way. It's, it looks it, like... It, well, yeah. you, in, uh, if, no one will understand the reference to MathNet, right? 
like no one actually will know what that is. i don't know the reference no i was gonna say There's, your kung fu panda to uh fire is like the perfect example of like uh really good cartoony pyro or cartoony natural oh, yeah. stuff it was fun to be a visual effects person working at an animation studio because you had you brought so many like there were there were so many visual effects people who ended up over there and it's just because there are so many things that you don't want to have to animate but having visual effects knowledge really augments uh the the skill set of and abilities of everybody there to not not work too hard yeah <laughs> on something that could be an easier problem uh let me see uh let me affect the nominal distance a little bit I don't know where I've placed this light in uh, in the space here. Let's see. What is... What, am I, what have I created? What have I done? Huh. What are we all doing? <laughs> I'm going to move my light all the way back. This is a very big scene, and I, I camera tracked it before uh, knowing how to normalize scenes well. Wait, let me see. So if I turn up this light, is it even... It's not even affecting that stuff, is it? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, there we go. Turn up the cone angle. All right, now we're talking. All right, so I'm just going to try to place a uh, a light somewhere that it uh, creates a bit of a... Uh... This looks so bad, you guys. But uh, yeah. it's exciting. It's exciting. I was trying to do something with flocking to make a tornado with like flocking and target attraction. And so I've got this thing where I can, <laughs> I can snake this tornado around and it'll always end up going down to that center point at the bottom, which I could in effect keyframe and after effects as well. The trick is to make that motion not appear so fast. That would actually, uh, well, there's, there's promise here, but there's a bunch of stuff that would have to be, uh, fixed before it looked good. Just the story. I like it. Story of my life. You know what I should be creating is a Tasmanian devil. Uh, yep. Around is, him is, is really is really where uh, either chasing him or have him oh, come out of one. Come out of the. Let's tornado. see. I'm going to have it chasing him. So what? What if I did that? All I'd have to do is scale down my particular system. See, I just transition it to cartoons when I when I know I'm about to fail. Yep, that's how you do it. And then and then and then you, it's, I can say, oh, it's just my you know, it's my veteran animation knowledge, just trying to come and be useful to everybody. Wow, I scaled that up like crazy. All right, what have we done? Okay, the smaller particles, uh, let's make them smaller. Maybe let's not have so many. Yeah, we're going to do a Tasmanian Devil chase. This is perfect. It's the same, sort of the same physics. And I know Stu is a huge fan of the Tasmanian <laughs> Devil lore. <laughs> <laughs> so it would make sense to have him observe this silently. <laughs> You still making your bangy things happen, Stu? Yeah, I got a little. Uh, I got some progress over here. All right, let's see. You're live. So I've got uh, I've got a little rig here now. Where so for each camera right and camera left flash, um, just a reminder. Like there's our beauty pass, and then I've got uh, the flashes busted out in their own pre comps, and then that for each one goes into an interactive light pass where I'm taking this crazy glow and multiplying it over. And uh, so basically I'm just sort of matting and colorizing my interactive light passes that I photographed with the little, um, with, with a cotton ball wadded on top of a, a LED flashlight basically. And then, uh, so then I'm, I'm comping the flashes back over. Then I'm also adding back in the interactive light that is multiplied with the flashes. So I'm in, I'm in uh, pre-comp, pre-comps galore here. But the result pre is that galore. 
This is a funny one. <laughs> uh, so you get this nice sense of like uh, when this when the flash on that side is bright, you get the cool uh, you get that side lit up by it, and you've kind of you see the shadows shifting around on his feet and that kind of stuff. So it's getting there. I'm figuring it out. I really want to make his little hands move like chug chug chug. Um, but in a way, it's kind of fun because it's like channeling as if I had had like motion control and had multiple passes to to play with in 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 an optical compositor or whatever. All right, back here, I am using one of uh, your favorite expressions, which, which is the two comp expression. That's that's my boy right there. And uh, I'm I'm linking it to uh, on my particular layer. I've added I'm adding some VFX shadow because uh, there's a, there would be a really distinct shadow uh, in this. And but it's a 3D scene, so it's a little bit weird to add a fake uh, 2D shadow. So uh, if anyone doesn't remember what VFX Shadow does, it's basically this. Uh, you have this really nice visual interface. Oops, let me scrunch my screen a little bit more. Um, where you establish what the uh, horizon line is, and then you establish the slant of the shadows, and you can kind of base that on, you know, other reference from the uh, shot. And on top of that all, you can go down to displacement, and I can say, look at the original footage and use that as a bit of a displacement on the shadow level itself. And I could smooth that out. I could yeah. feather that out. Uh, wonderful things like that. I can also have the shadow fade. Uh, but I'm using the two comp uh, expression because I attached two little nulls. They're a little bit hard to see. But uh, out here to the sides of this null controlling the tornado, and I did that so I can then, on my shadow effect, uh, basically place these uh, simple two comp effects. So it'll always pin uh, the left and right side of my ground plane to these two nulls as I go through here. And I'll manually adjust uh, maybe where this is. I guess this could technically be uh, somewhere in Z, so kind of converting a 2D plugin into a 3D result, which is kind of cool. So that should be down here. That should be right there. Oops, make this bigger. All right, and let me uh, make the shadow a little bit more um, soft. and have it fade a teeny bit. All these little things just really help. <laughs> this tornado looks like garbage, but that, that's, my, that's my, usually my MO for, uh, for the beginning half of these. And then they look like uh, polished garbage at the <laughs> end. So let me see uh, if this Tasmanian devil -y... <laughs> It's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very slow and not, not as chaotic as I would want a Tasmanian devil to be. Well, you've got 10 minutes to get it as chaotic as you would like and then to super comp it. All right. So let's see. So I'm going to switch my view uh, to the top view here. I could probably use uh, like a wiggle expression on this too, which might be truly more chaotic. But uh, I'm just going to take... Uh, these points and uh, make some kind of ridiculous uh, curves to this uh, path. And the reason I'm doing this in the top view is to try to keep uh, my tornado right on the uh, ground plane. This might give it some more uh, back and forth wackiness. Ah, oh, Seth, I really should have let you do this. I, 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 I didn't have a, as good an idea as I thought. That's the story right. of my life. I mean, I'm, Wait. I've got the same situation going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What are you working on over there, Seth? Uh, I, well, I briefly explored, <laughs> uh, right now I'm, I'm 
particular is doing something weird to me. Let me see if I can just apply this and get out and come back in. But uh, I've got the I've got an emitter that is uh, sending particles down toward a target position, and then upon their death, I have uh, an emitter with this like dust sequence particle coming out. And for a hot second, it actually looked kind of cool. And I thought, oh. I want to add some swirl to that. And so I added some swirl vortex thing to it and then I broke it. And now I'm <laughs> trying to get it back to what it was. And again, this is from user error. I, I still don't fully understand how to wield fluid, uh, the fluid dynamics to get what I want. It's a little well. It is. It's a little bit like throwing. I mean, there is simulation. So so just like anything, um, there's no control. You have yeah. to. There is no control. You 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 set it up as best as you can, and uh, let uh, let the simulation take the wheel. Have you uh, decided to normalize your scene, Hashi, or are you just continuing to work in giant um, space? I did. I did actually uh, normalize my scene. So uh, so in theory, this is all uh, working better now, scale wise. I will say uh, the normalized script. Now that I'm starting to do more VFX stuff lately, and uh, and not all MoGraph all the time, uh, that normalized uh, button has found its way into my interface. It really it, it it's so tremendously helpful, and I believe we've talked about it plenty on the show. But if you don't know, the, the normalized track script is a free script available from Workbench TV, and it makes it so you can turn your 3D scenes into something that. Uh, After Effects is very comfortable with because uh, everything is sort of centered around the comp's center point instead of around mixed and matched uh, center points, which is what you can get uh, with a camera tracker just by itself. All right. I'm just trying to try to sidelight this uh, tornado a little bit. I have one fully Terry Gilliam to arm of Ed 209 now. Ooh, here we come. Wait, let's, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Oh, excellent. So I made a little, this is the dumbest thing. I made a little 3D null and kind of tried to line it up with the action of the arm. And then a parent just cut out his... Uh, his stupid little that is the perfect way to do that <laughs> and then and then i just separated the dimensions which is the best and then just uh so now this arm slides back and forth on that 3d axis it's so stupid <laughs> and then and i just put a wiggle on it <laughs> and, and now i feel just ever so slightly better about my little ed 209 still life so now i'm gonna do the other arm Oh, he's so cute. That's that's the update from Dumbtown over here. I, for years, I have wanted to thank. By the way, thank you for letting us visit Dumbtown. It's a wonderful, wonderful. We had a wonderful <laughs> stay. I I have for years wanted to figure out how. I, I've just wanted to come up with a reason to make a short about toys, just so I could uh, do exactly what you're doing, which is. Like I've done several tutorials where like they involve just like dinosaur toys and puppeting them and stuff, but like I want like I want to make like an entire action extravaganza out of toys that's not 3D animated that's just like kablammed all up with but with all basically with realistic like action VFX like muzzle flashes and explosions and pyro and fire, but everything else is like clearly stop motion or action figurey and dumb. Dude, I'm, you know, you know, you know how to get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I'm so known for putting stupid toys in front of the camera for the sake of demoing a VFX thing that when I was demoing uh, for Adobe at IBC, the, the only thing they told me in advance was no robots. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, that's the dumbest rule no I've robots. ever heard in my life. <laughs> and wow. I just thought, you know, that... That, and that's that a bad rule. You, you guys hired the wrong guy. So you did nothing but robots, right? Yeah, I did nothing but robots. Good. Which is also the name of your I next know, I book. I did spaceships, obviously. Obviously, I did spaceships. I, I would like for nothing but robots to be the name of your autobiography, if you can swing that. <laughs> nothing but robes. Nothing but robots.
Uh, so you're pals with Joe from Workbench, right? Yes, we we gotta we we can get him on the show. I was gonna say the chat is requesting his appearance. All right, all right, let it be known. Stu and and Andrew Kramer are like the top of our like requirements yes, list as far as the chat's demands go. Mm. But but oh, we're uh, Joe from Workbench is, now, is, now, is on the list as well. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you gotta track down the Andrew Kramer and and find his uh, his lair. <laughs> He's the only one who will out pre comp me. <laughs> <laughs> and and or possibly use the uh, the mini flowchart view more than me. Oh, that's true. I just realized the mini this actually is a promising and could make a wide shot, but I just realized that everything's going the wrong way. Like. And I actually would have more control if I can. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can externalize the the tornado that's happening in my head. I need to. Right now, I. You have three minutes. So right now, <laughs> I have them emitting from the top and flocking toward a target at the bottom, and then when they die, the debris particles are coming up. What I need is for them to. St- emit from the ground flock toward mm-hmm. the target in the top. And so it wouldn't be emitted paired end of life. It would just be another emitter that's in the same location as the other one. So that's is gonna, let's see if I can do this in, excuse me, in three minutes. Okay. So first I make, <laughs> let me see if I can do it. I love it. I am just uh, doing some last ditch efforts on trying to uh, make my clouds look a little bit more volumetric, and I'm just going to try to let this RAM preview play. I always choose like a 10 second scene, which is uh, is a very (laughs) silly (laughs) thing to do. I need like the the quick, uh, like one and a half second shot. I also have my uh, my twister moving backwards. The uh, the top is moving faster than the bottom. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> that is really funny. All right. So, this is this is very very silly, but uh let's go with this. I I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed to do. <laughs> I should have instead parented every smoke particle to a null and arranged them by a mathematical formula. That was the coolest <laughs> sentence you've ever said. It, it tracked too, I'm positive. Anyway. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm gonna call it on my end. I'm 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 not gonna make it. Uh, I can tell I'm not going to make this any better. Uh, so no more value to the audience to watch me mess around with it more. I mean, this was the longest intro chat we've yeah, ever had on an episode before we actually started. Well, yeah. Projects. Now that said, well, yeah, my yeah. tornado isn't terrible. It just takes a little bit to render here in the visualizer, but I could. Even make it better. Ooh, that is looking great. You've got thirty seconds before our two hours. Hey, Michael, mark. is it called VFX and Chill with Michael and Hashi and Seth? <laughs> <laughs> is it called VFX? Is it called VF- VFX and Finish on Time? Oh Stu, we are you're, we're stealing thoughts from each other. <laughs> it's called it's called VFX and stress about a deadline. Yeah, VFX and uh, turn it oh in man. on time. I don't think so. Yes, uh, this was this was a fail on my end. I let everyone, I let y'all down. I was gonna say I feel really disappointed in your in your performance on this episode, Hashi. I was I was I was so overconfident that this would just work immediately, and I spent I spent so much time looking for roto mats. Hashi, no one here cares. They all love you. Uh, all right. Well, Ed Two D. Thank you all. Nine is uh is he's he's Ed Two D. Nine under the. Oh, let's oh, wait, switch let's, over. Yeah, let's, let's let's cut to Ed. Good lord. Oh yeah. See, that's 
that's what y'all came here for. <laughs> <laughs> These are the Gilliam arms, camera shake to hide the multitude of sins, fancier interactive light than is strictly necessary. And uh, that is gorgeous. We're using modern technology to try to simulate cotton balls. So I, we this ticked a lot of boxes for me. I don't know we about you guys. It, but... we did it. <laughs> Stupid little arms. <laughs> Wow. So yeah, right, we obviously it. need that's some kind of stop do. mo episode. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was really amazing to have have Stu here. Just the the number of of classic VFX shots throughout our lives that you have touched upon is really wonderful. So uh, make sure that you find and follow Stu in person uh, wherever he goes. <laughs> that, that is- bunch of you outside my door right there. there. <laughs> I'll, I'll post his address in the chat right now. Seems very appropriate. Absolutely. But yeah, the, if you ever have a nerdy uh, visual effects history question, um, the, yeah, direct it toward Stu and, and just, just try to poke him until he goes off. With, with it doesn't, crazy doesn't take much to yeah get, get me going. Uh can oh, I can I show I, you guys my this. tornado real quick? It says is, is, is it I want to see the, it yeah. for the first time in the world. Yes. It's not bad and it's actually kind of promising. Like I feel like I don't know if you guys can see the particles that are the debris that's coming at the bottom, but basically it's emitting from wherever I put it and flying up toward the one point in the cloud, which can be keyframe. Nice, that looks good. And so I could animate the motion if I bring it in here pretty decently. Anyway. It's uh, I mean, between the two of you, it's like it's, Hashi spent more time kind of on the look and the the lighting and the volumetricness, and you've got the really convincing motion. It's really nice. If, you know, the two of us could find time to work together and create something, but <laughs> then it would be called VFX and Chill with Hashi, and no one wants that. <laughs> no one no. wants that. Good God, Stu! Thanks for hanging out with us, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we got to see that transition one more time. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a feeling you'll be back a whole lot more um, until it's VFX and chill with Stu, Hashi, and Seth. Uh, that's the goal. Next but, time I'll I'll uh, I'll be good at it. That's what we'll we say it. every time. You need to <laughs> join me and Hashi's chat afterward, where we apologize to each other for being bad co-hosts and realize. <laughs> realize and, and to michael for just abusing the only person yeah. like supporting <laughs> everything <laughs> in the room yeah. Yeah. oh man <laughs> oh man uh, well no, hashi you want to talk guys. yeah man of course hashi you can talk last since i talked first oh sure well it was really wonderful to have a vfx legend stew with us today and thank you michael so much for all of your amazing backup info uh there is some really cool new features um maxon has bombarded the interwebs with uh with new things that have come out both in the cinema 4d front and the uh, uh after effects uh classic red giant stuff uh features that we've wanted for a really long time including Bang, uh, which you should open up and uh, play with. It's so fun yeah. to see what it looks like. Um, yeah, that, that's some of, those are some of my messages. Um, <laughs> get, get your uh, VFX and chill mug so you can join us uh, every Friday at 10 for this exciting adventure. And uh, yeah. That's all. The end. <laughs> see you guys. Bye.